This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula. I would actually say we've kind of discovered string theory too early. We landed upon, upon this thing that looks incredibly promising, and it contains all the bits of physics that we see in our universe in a very constrained way, but the energies it says we should see these things that are so above anything we can detect. It's kind of sad in a way. <laughs> this sounds like you're blaming the experimentalists. No, 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 I'm not blaming the experimentalists. I mean, this is just the practicalities of the universe. <laughs> Lots of people follow this YouTube channel because of the vlogs I made during my PhD in atmospheric physics at the University of Exeter. Unfortunately, however, I had to graduate at some point, and that necessarily meant the end of my videos showing what doing a PhD was like. However, there are lots of people out there doing interesting PhD projects, and so in this video series, I'm spending a few days with a new researcher each episode, showing you what their life is like, learning a bit about them, and learning about the topic of their thesis. This time, I'm spending a few days with Thomas, who's studying for a PhD in string theory at the University of Oxford. But before we talk about that, let me ask a question that you may well have. What exactly is string theory? If you can answer that, you'd probably win a fundamental physics prize. The best definition, I would say, for what string theory is, is it's a special limits of M-theory, which then makes you ask, what is M-theory? There are definitely statements you can make that you'd expect to be in a universe where string theory is true. If we live in a universe with string theory, what can we definitely rule out, if that makes sense? Which, was then, which then means if you were to detect any of these things, you know string theory would have to be wrong. I mean, these days, if someone calls themselves a string theorist, that doesn't even necessarily mean they're working in the theory of kind of quantized strings. Um, in terms of it means generically almost lots of different things going on in formal, formal um, theoretical physics and mathematical physics. There are people who are working on other, other theories of quantum gravity. String theory is just the best understood and the best developed of these theories. Now, I have a background in physics, and even I think this is tough to conceptualise, so don't worry if you're struggling. Because this video isn't just about the physics, it's about life as a research student at Oxford. And about life after being a research student at Oxford. This main thing I've been working on is using techniques of, from geometry and uh, machine learning coupled together to try and construct semi-realistic models of particle physics from string theory. This maybe gives you some hint of what could come next if string theory is to be true, rather than looking at what we have right now and then trying to guess at things that could fill in the holes. Why do this? Why do this? It's interesting and it feels, I think to me personally, it feels somewhat less undirected. Maybe understanding the world is something that we should just aim for as a species? I don't know. Maybe that's the best the best answer I can give. This is a bittersweet video for me, coming back to Oxford and to the physics department specifically. I did my undergraduate degree in physics here, and if you've followed my channel for a while, you know that the experience wasn't an entirely happy one for me. In fact, some of you may recognise Thomas from the video I made about revisiting my experience studying quantum field theory in my master's year. He acted as a kind of consultant. So this building was built after I was at the physics department. It actually adjoins the building that I was taught in, but it's... It's pretty spectacular. <laughs> I think there's a famous quote from Einstein that's basically like all he needed was paper, pencil, and a waste paper bin in order to do his research. And you know, this facility is basically just a big atrium in the middle, like a big courtyard, and then offices surrounding it, and they all just have spaces to write in. That's it, that's all you need to do theoretical physics. Okay, so carrying on, this is pretty typical. So open on the computer, it's just normally emails and Slack for random people contacting me. On the right hand side though, I then normally have Mathematica open, so then this is just a bunch of calculations that, well, I'm going back and forth between pen and paper calculations, random collections of papers and notes and all sorts of different things, depending on whatever I'm working on at the time. And then of course behind you, this isn't my writing on it uh, right now, but then there's always someone who's been working on, on the blackboard. You may think it's a stereotype that <laughs> theoretical, a physicist generally and theoretical physicists in particular have these. They are everywhere in this department. Like every surface is a blackboard pretty much. <laughs> I wanted to do a PhD for a long, long time. I was definitely in secondary school when I was first thinking about it, and I think it's that I was interested in doing some kind of scientific research, and so then PhD is the natural way to go. And then especially if I, as I became more interested in theoretical physics, then that's how you get into theoretical physics. I kind of knew what uh, doing a PhD was going to be. I mean, I, I spoke to lots of people doing PhDs when I was in my undergrad, watched your videos, and then saw a lot of it from there as well. And yeah, it's kind of what I expected, and I'm enjoying it, so. You're a rare breed, I gotta say. <laughs> So taking a string theory, a particular one type of string theory called E8 cross E8 heterotic string theory, and this lives in 10 dimensions. So you need some way to try and connect it to the three plus one dimensions that we have, where that plus one is, is time. So you need to wrap up your um, extra dimensions in some way. But if we have some manifold, I could write this as being, say, 
r, so it's just real numbers, times something else. One example of this could be uh, just r3, which would be three-dimensional space. So this is now a four-dimensional manifold? This is now a four-dimensional manifold. However, I could imagine we lived in a universe which was instead r2 cross again s1, where s1 is a circle. Still four-dimensional. Still four-dimensional, but a circle. Say this circle was incredibly small, in which case, if you were living on this space, you may not even know this thing even exists. You'd think that you were in you think You'd think you're actually in some effective space, which would be this uh, time across uh, two-dimensional space. So you're actually in a four-dimensional space, but your effective space that you experience, yes. you think is two-dimensional. Yeah. Right. Well, two plus one. So all I'm doing for the string theory case is we're saying we actually have some 10-dimensional space, okay? And I want to write this as, using similar notation to above, R13, which just means one time dimension, three spatial dimensions, okay? Cross some extra six dimensions, which is then normally, for the kind of compactifications I'm looking at, taking to be something called a clabby manifold. That's sort of your way of squirreling all the extra dimensions away into mm -hmm. a structure that you're not aware of. Yeah normally. Yeah. And this only becomes accessible at really high energies? Yeah. So uh, as you go to higher and higher energies, you'd start to notice these extra dimensions exist. In your research then, it's working out what form this takes. Yeah, what could you choose for this? And how do you search for this? Now, the space of possible constructions there is vast, absolutely incredibly, incredibly huge. And the vast majority of these will look nothing like uh, particle physics. There's a challenge of then trying to make constructions that what you end up with then does start to look like particle physics. And so what I've been doing is using, in particular, machine learning techniques to give a family of these constructions to a computer and allow it to modify it in a way until what it's left with is a particular compactification that the 4D physics looks like the standard model. The first way we attempt to do this is I give it literally one particular compactification which will look nothing like the standard model. And then I train it to get points, essentially, by doing small adjustments to this compactification, getting closer and closer towards the standard model. If it's moving away from stuff like the standard model, we start giving it negative points. And so over time, it trains how it gets uh, higher and higher points, so it gets closer and closer to the standard model. So really try and treat what we're doing as a game, where the objective of the game is find the standard model in the space. And then it can then appear at random places in this, and it has to run to a nearby standard model. There is no in and out data, there's just an environment which it's exploring. And the environment is so huge, you could never scan it directly with a computer. So instead you're doing this kind of targeted searching by knowing what you want to end up with. As a rule of thumb, physics looks more intimidating on the page or on the blackboard up to a point. And then, when you see something like this, that's actually pretty simple to write down, run. The more simple something looks on the page if you're in a high-level institute like this, the more complicated it is. <laughs> like, this is far, far beyond my ability to understand. This was home for me for four years. I'm actually walking towards where I lived in my first year. And uh, it's very, a lot's changed. Like, they built a lot of new buildings and things look different, but it feels very, very familiar walking around. When I was last here, physics kind of undid me. But now, two things are different. Firstly, I'm with my wife. <laughs> and secondly... So here on Broad Street in Oxford, which is opposite the History of Science Museum and the Sheldonian Theatre, which is where you graduate, there's a bookshop called Blackwell's. And when I was a student, I used to come in here all the time because they had an amazing, amazing room full of books about science. Now, I've come back out of the rain to look for a specific book. <laughs> oh my god! Oh wait, I'm right next to Jeremy Hunt. <laughs> oh dear. A lot's changed since I was here. I had to commit a crime. I'm not committing. <laughs> if you told me when I was in the first year and looking around this shop that I'd have a book in here one day, I never would have believed you. So where are we going now? Uh, so we're just going to go to a seminar given by a couple of the students uh, who just finished their first year. I did it um, last year, yeah. Where the first year your class is like a probationary research student and then you kind of get promoted to be a full DPhil or PhD student. And it's worth stating, I'm not allowed to film this. So this is, this is yet more classic Ox Oxbridge behind closed doors, but um, we'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> so we're out the other side of that seminar and uh, Thomas is over here and we're also joined by... Ryan. 
Ryan, who was one of the speakers at the seminar, and you very graciously agreed to sort of give a brief overview of what you were talking about. So I work in quantum gravity. What that is, is trying to understand how to combine general relativity that we know works very well and, uh, and quantum mechanics. And so one way to approach this and what quantum gravity is, is if you had a space with some matter in it, it curves in one particular way. In order to add quantumness in, or fuzziness in a, in a way, you imagine you take a sphere, for example. It's not just a sphere, but it's more like a fuzzy sphere, so you're considering all possible ways it could be bent. If you've ever played a video game and you've looked at sort of things in the video game, like say you have a ball, you've noticed it's not particularly round. It might be, it's like polygonized. One way of doing that is to triangulate it. So you put triangles everywhere and that can give you sort of an approximation to a sphere. And so what I'm doing is similar to that. You approximate the, the space. Uh, I usually work in two dimensions, but it's been done in three and four dimensions, four dimensions being our space. And then the ultimate objective of this is it makes calculations does it make them easier or does it make them possible? It makes them possible, yeah. And if that wasn't enough, by the way, you know, doing a PhD in quantum gravity, Ryan also happens to make games. It's called Flaggle. It's a flag with one G, L-E dot I-O. And another one is called Wikilinks, which I actually quite enjoy. It's like the Wikipedia game, but you don't get to see the article. What, what's your working relationship like with your supervisor? Like, how does that oh, work? Brilliant. No, it's brilliant. I have a very good working relationship with my supervisor. I mean, I'm also very lucky that the things I'm interested in are also interesting to my supervisor as well. I think we have very similar interests, and so that does help. Did you choose him as a supervisor? Yeah, I did. I did choose him as a supervisor. And I'm very happy I did, because it's worked out very well. I mean, the PhD, I think, has been pretty successful. Wait, is this just random stuff? Yeah. No, this is actually us calculating too. Uh, but we were... <laughs> <laughs> just put what, literally Any whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, there'll be someone who's yeah. just like, oh, We're now geometer in the... There's a lot of meetings, <laughs> as you just saw, but there's also lots of reading, of reading of new papers, reading of old papers, or reading of textbooks, learning of new areas of theoretical physics that maybe I don't know as well, that'd be good to know. The rest of the time is, goes between calculating or programming, I would say, is the vast majority of the research, as you're saying. But even then, there's a back and forward to that, because to do the physics uh, on pen and paper beforehand relies on some very high level maths, before I even go anywhere near a computer. The physics department here is huge, and I think that's a, that's a massive uh, benefit. Like, if, if I need to talk to an expert on something, like for example, say I want to talk about cosmology, uh, then well, behind where you're sat, there's the, the DWB and then Pedro Ferreira. I've had meetings with him before, talking just about cosmology. Or I can then go off to the maths department and talk to some two algebraic geometers, or I can talk to the physicist in the math department too, and we talk there. If, if I'm stuck with something, there is an expert somewhere. And that's one thing that's quite nice about being in quite a big department. I mean, as a graduate student, you're not necessarily so involved in the colleges as you are as an undergraduate. But it is still quite nice sort of having those kind of social connections and stuff. So, I mean, I'm friends with people that I probably would have never have met if it wasn't through colleges. So one of my uh, closest friends at Oxford is in, in Assyriology, so like ancient Iraq. And I, I don't think I would have ever met him if it wasn't for, uh, for colleges. It's great, and it's very collaborative too. So the whole building was designed such that you could either work by yourself or, collaborative, or very collaboratively. I don't think necessarily being at Oxford has made it more intimidating as time's gone on. Again, maybe when you first start, but it doesn't take long for that to disappear because it's very relaxed. Not what I would expect you to say, actually. So it's, it's actually quite relaxing. <laughs> it's very relaxing. It's very relaxing, yeah. And then people are very kind, very friendly, and so it's a very, yeah, it's very nice. But I mean, really, we're just a bunch of nerds, right? That's all we are. We're a bunch of nerds, and we just hang out and talk about physics. That's what we do. I had one more thing to do before I left Oxford. Well, two things. I gave a talk to the Physics Society that I used to be on the committee of about science communication and YouTube, and it was great to meet so many of you there. But I also had a book to deliver to my college library. Yes, I do. So I just had a book. I was wondering if I could donate a copy. Oh yes, that would be great. Partly to inspire future physicists at St Peter's to take the path of atmospheric study, and partly to bring me closure. That'll do. <laughs> great. Okay. Thank you so much for well, that's thank that. you very much. And then the last question, this is the one that everyone always dreads having. Uh, what, what's after this? What do you want to do after the PhD? Oh, that's not a question, Charlie. It's an easy one. This one, I, I want to continue in academia if I can. Yeah, I mean, there's a level. Of course, it's a competitive thing. So one, one step at a time. My aim is, yeah, is to remain in academia. I think you may be the first person in the history of this series to actually give that answer. <laughs> Genuinely, I think you might be. University is just one part of your time on Earth. Whether you're an academic or a sensible person with a real job or a YouTuber, but it's a time that casts a long shadow. The skills and friends and memories that you develop at university can last a lifetime, but those memories can be negative ones. In my case, they've cast a shadow for 10 years.
But with this trip, I feel like I finally stepped out of their shadow and see myself as a very different person to who I was back then. And just as I'm excited to move into the next stage of my life, moving past and accepting what happened to me, I'm excited to see where Thomas's career goes and how his positive experience here in Oxford will influence what answers he will contribute to some of the biggest questions in the universe. In this video, we went pretty light on the maths, as that's not something everyone is interested in. If, however, you would like to watch Thomas and I discussing the maths of his research in more detail, then there is a whole video of that over on Nebula, alongside other bonus videos from this PhD story series, and other exclusive videos from me, and exclusive extra videos from other creators, because Nebula is a streaming service co-owned by more than 150 creators who all make informative, entertaining, thoughtful videos and podcasts. By watching our videos on Nebula, you get access before viewers on YouTube do so, can watch bonus content, and do so with no adverts in or before or around any of our videos. But most importantly, by signing up for Nebula, you directly support creators like me, as your subscription fee for Nebula is split between the creators that you watch, allowing us to make more and more ambitious projects. You can get a subscription at curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, because we're partnered with CuriosityStream, the biggest and best source of documentaries on the internet, with thousands of titles to choose from. If you enjoyed this video, then you should definitely check out one of the biggest names in string theory, Brian Greene, talking about the history of quantum mechanics in Exploring Quantum History, or one of the thousands of other documentaries available across history, culture, science, and the natural world. So head to curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark and enjoy a 26% discount on access to both services. That's just over a dollar a month for access to the best documentaries and exclusive access to some of the best thoughtful videos on the internet. With thanks to CuriosityStream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching this video. As you could probably tell, it was a little more personal than normal. And yeah, this was an experience filming this one. Thanks must also go to Thomas for being so generous with his time. I'll leave a link in the description to his research page if you'd like to check out his papers. And I'll also put up on the screen some suggested viewing if you'd like to watch something next, including a link to the playlist for this PhD Stories series. There's also a thing on screen if you would like to subscribe to this channel and if you would like to check out Brilliant, which would really support this channel. That just leaves me to say thank you so much again for watching. Please do pop the video a like if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.